So uh, I hope I have some interesting examples here about um, how we use these concepts, which were introduced by Alex and Misha, kind of from start to finish for a couple projects in our lab. Uh, so for what I'm going to be talking about, uh, we're using one specific uh, release method to uh, get our peptide off the solid phase, and that's the cyclative release, which was mentioned by Alex. Uh, so in this case, uh, we just add a base to a peptide that has a free N-terminal thiol, and this will self-cyclize uh, off of this disulfide-linked resin. And what we then receive is uh, directly the, the cyclic disulfide macrocycle and sort of a one-step release plus cyclization reaction. So everything's going to use this. Uh, I'm going to present some work from a previous student in the lab, um, Sevan, who graduated a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, this work, uh, for now, is all using commercially available peptide synthesis setups. So this was run in a 4x96 uh, SPPS setup. And uh, what Sevan focused on was a so-called lateral diversification. So this is the step that follows after our peptide synthesis. So we're going to get this um, cyclic disulfide macrocycle uh, off the resin as a stock in DMSO. And then we're going to do some solution phase chemistry with this. We're going to distribute multiple copies of this scaffold to do combinatorial reactions, which increase the size and the diversity of our libraries. Specifically, uh, we did uh, an amide coupling. So this is what the sort of disulfide macrocycle scaffold would look like uh, that we get off the resin. Uh, the key here is it has this free exocyclic amine. We're going to react this with carboxylic acids, and we're going to form these sort of isolated macrocycle scaffolds here. And um, so we're doing amide couplings, which is the same chemistry which we actually do on resin to make our peptide. Um, but there are some key differences here. Uh, one is that we're using uh, carboxylic acids and not ethanol amino acids. So, of course, uh, probably everyone on the call knows that there are many, a pretty good uh, amount of ethanol amino acids that are commercially available. Uh, but carboxylic acids are uh, the uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, commercially available pool of drug-like building blocks. So by having our synthetic workflow include this functional group, we can uh, kind of nicely in increase the chemical diversity of our final products. Okay, and the second uh, important difference here with this last solution phase step is because it's uh, using things in solution, we can change the scale simply by transferring different volumes. So we have complete control over the scale. Uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, this is our uh, disulfide uh, macrocycle stock of peptide, which we just have in DMSO on a plate. Um, we're then going to use this echo to transfer exactly the volume and amount of peptide which we want. Uh, in this case, we opted for a picomole scale approach. So we transfer around 20 nanoliters of our peptide, which corresponds to roughly 200 picomoles of peptide. And we transfer this directly into the plate in which we're going to run our assay. After the peptide, we transfer 10 equivalents of a pre-activated carboxylic acid. We just gently mix these droplets. We leave them for five hours to react and directly to these same exact wells, we add our assay reagents. So for example, like uh, an enzyme and some sort of fluorogenic substrate. And then we read the results of this assay directly in the same plate as well. So uh, what's nice about this approach is um, it's extremely efficient. So we're doing this reaction at the um, smallest scale possible. 100% of this final product that we make is then tested. We use all of it, it's a single use. Uh, so this is the most efficient way that you can you can run this reaction. Uh, so you have uh, enough peptide to repeat this uh, several thousand times over. So we're going to use this approach, uh, but first we actually need to design a library. So we designed a library against thrombin. It started with the synthesis of 384 of these disulfide scaffolds, uh, which were made from a total pool of 27 FMOC building blocks. Uh, we then reacted these 384 uh, base macrocycles with these 12 different carboxylic acids for around 4,500 isolated macrocycle products. And then we took them for screening. Uh, this is what the screening results looked like. So this was, uh, again, a screening against thrombin. So this was um, sort of a standard uh, biochemical enzymatic assay where we mix thrombin together with a fluorogenic substrate. Um, in the absence of an inhibitor, the well will show color. Uh, if the reaction is inhibited, then the well does not show color. So we've sort of inverted that here. I'll explain the meaning of this green color in the map. 
Uh, something that's green didn't show any color in the assay, which means there was a high inhibition of this reaction. Uh, white is the inverse. So the hits that we're looking for are in green. Um, I have six grids here, and I just put the six grids so they fit on a screen. Uh, but looking at, for example, this left grid, we've plotted the different uh, macrocycle scaffolds uh, vertically in different rows, and we've plotted the different carboxylic acids horizontally in different columns. Uh, so something that's a bit interesting about the, the, the results we get here is, you know, for example, in the fourth column from the right, you can see that uh, often you find some, some green wells, which means often you're finding some inhibition. This means that this particular carboxylic acid has a tendency to give products which inhibit, thr which inhibit thrombin uh, with many different types of peptide scaffolds. And you can do also the inverse here. We see some horizontal lines of green, and it means exactly the opposite. We have a peptide scaffold, which has a tendency to inhibit thrombin with different carboxylic acids. Um, so we see both patterns, which is kind of interesting. Uh, what we did is we just took the three um, uh, wells, which had the highest inhibition, resynthesized and purified those compounds. And we could then confirm that in this assay, we found, uh, we found some compounds with moderate inhibition against thrombin around 100 nanomolar. Uh, so we followed this up. We sent one of these compounds to our collaborators in Italy. That's uh, Professor Angelini and Professor Sandron. And they were able to crystallize this compound uh, with thrombin. And we were very happy to see actually that the molecule binds this well-defined S1 binding pocket. And actually this uh, lateral carboxylic acid group is sitting inside that pocket and making a specific interaction, um, a halogen pi interaction with one of the side chains there. So th these results were important for us because um, we started from this kind of crude synthetic products uh, and we wanted to know, well, can we actually find binders from these. And we see here that, yes, actually, we can find a specific binder from these crude synthetic libraries. I'll quickly mention a very similar approach against MDM2. Um, in this case, we synthesized 192 macrocycles, uh, which were combinatorially reacted with 100, around 100 carboxylic acids. Um, so this was against MDM2. This isn't an enzymatic assay. This is an assay based on fluorescence polarization. Um, and you can see the result here is noisier than on the previous slide. Uh, but what we were able to see is this row, which shows many green wells or greener wells, suggesting that this um, peptide scaffold uh, has a tendency to inhibit MDM2. We resynthesized one of the most uh, inhibiting combinations, uh, and we found that we did have a sub-micromolar binder to MDM2, but a rather weak one. Um, and so this was a good starting point, actually, for a big benefit with our approach. Um, knowing that we have this hit scaffold, which contains one, two, three, four building blocks, we can then make a uh, second iteration of this library, where we, for example, uh, change each of these building blocks with, say, five different close analogs and make all those combinations, which might then, uh, or a subset of those combinations, which might then improve the binding affinity of this compound. We did this with 135 analogs. And actually we found, uh, I think we made nine different macrocycle scaffolds. We found that the, the hit macrocycle scaffold was the best. We didn't find a better one of those. We did find a more optimal carboxylic acid, which improved the binding affinity in this assay by around ninefold. Okay, uh, so that's the end of this, uh, this like previously published work. And, um, now we have some very recent ongoing un unpublished work that I thought would be interesting to mention, particularly because of the, uh, the synthesizer upgrade, which Misha was talking about. So once we had this kind of set up in the lab, we asked ourselves, okay, well, now that we can use so many more building blocks and make so many more things, what's the highest diversity that we can, we can make in a library? So I will show um, a plan from a library which we synthesized very recently. Um, and the changes now with these new tools we have are that we will make, uh, say, 1,500 of these disulfide macrocycle formers. And we'll make these 1,500 from a total pool of 250 F-mock amino acids. We'll combine these 1,500 macrocycles with 20 different carboxylic acids to make a total of around 30,000 of these similar looking reaction products. Um, there's some key, uh, key things to note here. Uh, so we react each macrocycle with 20 carboxylic acids, 
but we actually pick those 20 uh, as a random subset of 350. So we're using 350 carboxylic acids to diversify these base peptides, but one of these carboxylic acids is only being used, say, 80 times. We're not making all the combinations. We're making a random subset, but we're using a very large number of building blocks. Okay, so another way to, um, to kind of show this here, um, I've talked about a couple libraries here, and I just want to compare them. So in the first case, we talked about a thrombin-targeted library, which used 384 peptide macrocycles, which were reacted um, with 12 different carboxylic acids, and we made all the combinations of those. So we covered, let's say, this region of, uh, of the space. Um, and actually, the total... Uh, Sorry, excuse me. And, and then for the super diversity library, the big difference is now we're making four times as many peptide macrocycles, 1500, uh, and we reacted them with the total possible number of 350 carboxylic acids. So we're, we're accessing a much larger region of chemical space. Something that's important to note here is we're not now making all combinations of the peptides with the carboxylic acids because it's too many for us to, to handle. So instead we're sampling this chemical, this chemical space. We're making a, uh, a subset of, this, uh, of these combinations. So this is a nice way to demonstrate just how much this tool uh, with the synthesizer has helped us increase the diversity and size of our, our libraries. Um, uh, an easy way to look at this for us is the total number of possible products we can make in an experiment. So in the Thrombin library, the total number we can make with the tens of building blocks we used was 45,000, and we synthesized 10% of that space. Now we use several hundreds of building blocks, and we have... Um, we. See, as it makes sense, the, the total number of possible products increases exponentially as you increase the number of building blocks. Uh, so now we have almost 8 billion possibilities in the, um, in the recent plan that I showed you. And we synthesized a significant number, 30,000, but now that's only 0.0004% of the um, total number of possible molecules we can make. For us, this, um, this low coverage, this low synthetic coverage percent uh, indicates that uh, if you've done your library planning well, if you have a low coverage number and you make a lot of compounds, you have a very diverse library. You can think about this more generally, um, that what this tool has done just in terms of chemical space is, is, is now lets us access libraries that, that are uh, more diverse and access more chemical space, sample chemical space. Um, so we're really excited to try this library. It's, it, we're screening it right now because uh, it's one of the highest diversity label-free peptide-based libraries that's been synthesized. And um, uh, currently in the lab, some people are working on kind of taking this further, continuing the trend and um, figuring out ways which we can make bigger libraries and more diverse libraries to increase our chances at screening. So that brings me kind of to the end. A quick summary then from our side, um, some key checkpoints for our lab so far, this is over the course of the last um, several years, has been we've achieved this like very high throughput synthesis of peptides and macrocycles um, because we have access to these uh, synthetic building blocks uh, which give us a higher diversity than, for example, uh, natural uh, natural amino acids, we can still make small peptides which are diverse and closer to a rule of five property space. Um, in addition, we've uh, found that we have ligands for model targets like thrombin and MDM2. And so the most important goal of our lab right now at the moment is finding potent uh, compounds against undruggable, so-called undruggable targets, which are inside the cell. And this is what uh, uh, most, if not all, people in our lab are currently working on. Okay, that's the end for us. And I think I'll just thank everyone also on behalf of uh, Alex and Misha, the organizers, Wendy and Deirdre. You guys did a great job. Thanks for bringing everyone together. Uh, it's really cool. Um, Christian Bain, Alex, Misha, thanks for the presentations. Uh, and the audience, thanks for sticking around. I hope you found something interesting here. Uh, if you use social media, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to answer any questions. And of course, if you have specific questions, then you can email our professor, Christian Hines.